Hello, it's so great to be here. Are there biological differences between men and women? I mean, besides our genitals, we know that. I mean, interesting, valuable biological differences. So this is not a topic I ever wanted to study. I want to avoid that topic. I have a household full of women. Believe me, I don't want to talk about this topic. Except, I spent 10 years running experiments in my laboratory to try to understand why people behave in a good way, a moral way, or an evil way. And guess what I found? A lot of bad boys. Not that many bad girls. And I really want to know why. And honestly, it's really fun to be a bad boy. I started jumping out of airplanes recently. Man, that's fun. It's really fun. You get to be a superhero for like a minute while you're skydiving. So I said, you know, I should study this question. So we began looking at a variety of ways that men and women are different behaviorally. I don't know what's in your heart, but I can measure the underlying uh, neurobiology that can drive some of these differences. And I think some of the things we found may surprise you. So, first interesting fact. All the humans start out on the female body type. We all start out as women. Pretty interesting. So you're a little embryo, in about four weeks, you're a little fetus. And then if you have a Y chromosome, you start making testosterone and you sexually differentiate. Except sometimes you don't. And when you don't, it's really interesting. So you know what happens if you do, but when you don't, something unusual happens. So it turns out that testosterone, which we think of as the prototypical male hormone, male hormone associated with virility and power, is actually very impotent. It's bound up in this little shell and it can't get into its receptor. It doesn't do any good. So about 2% of testosterone is free. Free testosterone. Runs around, gets in a receptor, has an effect. The rest of it, impotent. So it turns out that nature has given us a workaround for this impotent testosterone and it's called, important word, 5-alpha reductase. What is that? It's a little hormone, a little enzyme that attacks testosterone and frees it up but it takes off a couple parts of it and turns it into high-octane testosterone, which is called, big word, dihydrotestosterone, DHT. Let's call it DHT. So DHT is the stuff that really makes males different than females. So males have five to 10 times more testosterone than females, and it's DHT that's responsible for vocal cord deepening and muscle growth and hairiness. If you get too much, your hair falls out. Males, males get uh, male pattern baldness. Women don't get that very often. Okay, so DHT, it's the stuff, except when it's not. So it turns out there are two isolated villages in the world, one in Honduras and one in Mexico, in which, perhaps by magic, when some girls turn 12, they turn into boys. Why does this happen? Because these are isolated villages, and a lot of cousins are married cousins, and there's a recessive gene to make 5-alpha reductase. And if you get two copies of the, this recessive gene, your testosterone's all bound up. So when these little kids are born, they look like girls. Physically, they look like girls. But then they hit puberty, 12 years old. And they get a surge of testosterone because they actually have a Y chromosome. And now, all that testosterone floating around, some of that free testosterone gets into the receptors and the genitals descend, the vocal cords get deeper, and those girls turn into boys. Now, here's what's interesting about this. In these two isolated villages, separately, they both develop rituals around this. Oh, you're one of those special things. We're gonna have a giant party in the village. You're one of those very important people who change genders. They're very sought after as marriage partners. They can reproduce normally, they can have children, they're the most special people in the world because they got to change. Okay. Now, there's a conflict in this. If you instead have two X chromosomes and a Y, you get an extra chromosome, then you're kind of in bad shape. So now you're a halvesy, right? So you have male genitals, but you also have breasts. And now you don't know what you're doing. These individuals, called Klinefelter syndrome, they tend to be mildly mentally retarded. They're generally sterile. 
they have gender, gender, gender identity issues all the time, and they don't have very pleasant lives because nature really didn't work out the system very well for them. So that's a whole different ballgame, quite rare, uh, but when it happens, it's um, unfortunate. Okay, so I started studying the bad boys because I've been doing experiments for 10 years on what one of my colleagues said was known to be only a female hormone, oxytocin. So oxytocin classically is associated with birth and breastfeeding. And yet in the animal literature, for animals that live together, there was many findings suggesting that both male and females of social animals release oxytocin to identify safety or familiarity. It says, oh, that's that nice little rodent that I'm living with. I release oxytocin and I'll affiliate with it. I will live together. We'll live in the world together. So I said, maybe humans do this. I was interested in this good and bad behavior. Maybe it's oxytocin that motivates us to be moral, to treat each other well, to be generous, kind, compassionate. So it turns out that oxytocin is very hard to measure. That's why no one had the crazy idea like I did to study this before. It's a very shy little molecule. You have to sort of provoke it to come out of the brain and then capture it really fast before it disappears. But once we solve that technical problem, we've run studies not only in the lab, but in the field, and I'll tell you about a couple of those in a second, to identify how oxytocin works, the brain circuit it activates, what turns it on, what turns it off. And in 10 years worth of experiments, we found a couple interesting things. One is that um, oxytocin is released for a whole variety of positive behaviors. Essentially, oxytocin encapsulates the golden rule. If you're nice to somebody, and they know it, their brain releases oxytocin and motivates them to be nice to you. We studied this in a lab by using monetary transfer. Someone shares money with you, you release oxytocin, you share it back with them. Um, someone hugs you, touches you, you release oxytocin, you want to be nice back to them, great way to connect. So in all these experiments, we found that in men and women, oxytocin motivated positive social behaviors, what we call moral behaviors. Right? So we have a moral molecule. That's really exciting. But interestingly, in every experiment I've run in 10 years, women always release more oxytocin than men. And they're subsequently more trustworthy, more generous, more compassionate, more empathic. Women are nicer than men. Now you know why. <laughs> Except, <laughs> guess what? Anybody, when they're ovulating, ever cry at movies a lot? Estrogen makes you super sensitive to to oxytocin. So when your estrogen is high, like when you're ovulating, oh, you're so sensitive to everybody around you, positive and negative, and this is part of our biology. You want to be more sensitive when you're ovulating. You want to make sure that guy next to you really is the guy you want to be with, right? You want to be much more careful when you potentially could get pregnant. So women, you guys are more nicer than we are. You're also more complicated, and that's why we love you so much. <laughs> right, so interestingly, I'll, t I'll take a clap for that, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. In addition, remember our friend testosterone? Very potent oxytocin inhibitor. So in experiments, when people, instead of cooperating, say sharing money, when people don't cooperate, this is done by computer, you don't see anybody, so someone just doesn't want to play nice with you, men but not women get this big spike in testosterone, the impotent kind and the high octane kind, and what do they do? they have an aggressive response. They want to enforce the rules. And if they want to beat you up as well, right? Women don't get this hot physiologic response. So when we talk to women in these experiments who people don't cooperate with, they say, I don't like it, wasn't friendly, wasn't, wasn't nice, but they don't want to go kill the other person. So women are calmer. I think women are going to make better negotiators. They don't take it personally. Guys take it personally. This guy didn't cooperate with me, I'm going to find him. So no, 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 it's an anonymous experiment. You can't do that. It's okay. All right. So isn't this great? And this is, I think, counter to our intuition, right? We think of women as more emotional. In fact, in many cases, not. They don't have this hot physiologic, res physiologic response. They don't have to protect their space. They can affiliate better. They connect better. And this is a part of our biology. Isn't that great? Okay, here's a hard one. IQ. Guess what? No difference on average. But there is a difference in the distribution. Most women are closer to the average IQ. For men, many more dullards and many more geniuses. Why would that be the case? 
Because of you guys. Because what's the sexiest thing on a guy, ladies? His brain. Come on, you love the sexy, smart guys, don't you? <laughs> All right. So because women are the primary choosers when it comes to sexual reproduction, Brains are sexy, brains give you more resources, brains mean you can survive and you're not as stupid as all the other guys who are jumping out of airplanes, sorry. Uh, that perpetuates that we want higher, you know, super crazy genius males, but there's always a cost in evolution. There's no free lunch. How do you get more super smart males? You generate a whole bunch of really bad versions who are super dumb, okay? So that's part of this sexual selection model, which is very interesting. Okay, last topic, the argument center, right? When you argue with your boyfriend, husband, right? What does he always say? Why are you bringing up that stuff from 10 years ago? Right, okay. And, and this is very interesting. It turns out that if you take the human brain and you watch it evolve from age zero up to age 25 and just map out the areas in the brain that grow more rapidly than the rest of the brain, you find great differences in males and females. And the number one difference we find in females is an area of the brain in from the ears called the hippocampus that generates long-term memory. You guys have a bigger hippocampus than males do. You remember things better. So you do remember what we discussed 10 years ago. We don't. <laughs> What's the area that grows fastest for males? an area, also in from the ears, called the amygdala, which is associated with emotion and aggression and fear. Ah, that's what we do. That's what we do best. We can do other things, but we have this area which, that's hyperactive in males, okay? So, please forgive your spouse, your boyfriend, if he doesn't remember what you said 10 years ago. Our brains aren't set up for that. Okay. So, What's the punchline here? I think we should have a great sense of acceptance. It's very hard to study neuroscience and not have an understanding of, in some sense, how similar we are in body types and brains, but also how every brain is different. And those differences sometimes cross on gender levels, sometimes they cross on whether I have five alpha reductase, and sometimes they're just random. But I think coming to a notion of acceptance for differences as one of the wonderful parts of life is a great way to appreciate both the men and the women in our lives. Okay, guys, you can read more here. Thank you so much for listening.